We've learned about group stages, and in process groups in particular, there are some advanced group issues that we should note when facilitating a group that can impact how a group progresses through those stages. The first is the mascot. The mascot is when a group member's input is dismissed by the, the entire group. This is insidious and is important to interrupt because if this occurs, the group starts to discount eventually everyone's input. In other words, all members should be valued and if any one member is devalued within a group, it is uh, unfortunately a marker that everyone will eventually suffer the same fate. And so we want to intervene there and intervene early. The second is self-disclosure. Self-disclosure should be somewhat of a balance. Too little self-disclosure can lead to group members having peripheral roles with little chance for what Yalom calls reality testing. In other words, getting interpersonal feedback from other group members about how they show up and uh, whether or not their own take on the situation is accurate. Now, too much self-disclosure can also be problematic because it'll provoke irritation in group members eventually at the, at the beginning of, an, of a group, especially a more quiet, uh, sensitive, kind of anxious group. Group members can be very grateful that, that another group member has taken on a lot of the action. But eventually it's going to create irritation because that member will take up too much of group time. And it also will create undue pressure on other members to disclose if that person is a, more of a, what we call a provocateur. And so we, in, with self-disclosure, we want to be careful to maintain a balance where all members are self-disclosing to the extent uh, that they feel comfortable, but they're, they're all involved in group process and no one is what we consider monopolizing the group and no one is completely on the periphery. Leader self-disclosure is also important to look at here. If we are too cavalier with self-disclosure, it can be destructive to the group and can lead to the group becoming demoralized. An example of that is if the group leader demonstrates frustration and impatience with the group and, where the, and basically if the group is not progressing the way that the group leader thinks it should. That can be a detrimental to group process and you wouldn't want to disclose that to group members. Okay? Next let's look at subgrouping. This is sometimes called extra group meetings. I will add here that while this is a very important consideration for process groups that meet long term, it's very rare to see subgrouping happen in other types of groups, psychoeducational or support groups, and it become problematic. It's really only problematic when we look at more process-based groups. So we want to be careful of subgrouping and coalitions during process groups because secrets between group members can inhibit the group process. Again, Yalom says extra group meetings are okay, but only if members are willing to discuss what happened openly afterward. Okay? And Yalom's right, I think, when he says that you can't really prevent extra group meetings from happening. Members are going to do that regardless of whether you discourage it or not. Okay, I'm going to move on to concurrent therapy, also a very important consideration for process groups. There are boundary issues that can occur with concurrent therapy I'm going to get to in a moment, but let's start with the positives, which is that some members benefit from individual counseling in addition to group counseling. Now, when would that occur? Well, it would occur if the person has situational issues that are so intense they cannot be well managed within a group. They cannot adequately be addressed in groups. Suicidality, major life changes, they're all fodder for individual counseling. Okay? Now, concurrent therapy can be useful, but it, we have some boundary issues we should be aware of. The first is that it's not unusual for a member who's receiving individual counseling to be more of an observer in the group and to discuss their thoughts and feelings about the group process in individual counseling, which is obviously detrimental to group work. And so the group therapist and individual therapist should be in communication when there's individual therapy happening concurrently with group and making sure that group members are discussing what their thoughts and feelings of, of what's happening in the group in the group situation itself and not in individual counseling. Okay? The other boundary issues that we want to be sensitive to here is that groups can um, 
and I think this is true with individual work as well, group, groups can really push clients to make major change and growth in their lives, often major important changes. I'll also add that when one person changes, their social environment needs to adjust and change with them, otherwise the person will feel like they're leaving the social circle behind. Now a really great example of that is if a person is in individual counseling and they make major changes, it can actually be detrimental to their, uh, their uh, intimate relationship or their marriage because um, if their spouse or their partner is not changing with them, again, they can almost outgrow that relationship. So in those situations in individual counseling, you would want the spouse or partner to also go to their own individual counseling concurrently if possible. Now, and again, in group work, we have to be sensitive to it because groups can also engender quite a lot of interpersonal learning and growth. And we would want the people in their lives that are, you know, that are most affected by that to be aware of it and to do their own work to get on the same kind of page. And sometimes a couple's counseling referral or an individual counseling referral for the, uh, the, the, uh, the other partner in the group is an important consideration. Uh, when doing group work. And so the, we've just explored then some advanced issues that can occur in process groups.